is live. We live? We live. The Hangout on Air is live. We're live, Nicole Lee. Hello. Jenny has, like, every time we go live, magically transformed herself into a logo. Whoa. Yeah. You should um, sell that technology. I'm telling you, she should use her powers for good. <laughs> All right. Um, we're recording. I'm ready to go. You ready to go? Yep. Let's light this candle. I don't know what that means. Okay, Google. How can I support Daily Tech News Show? You can show your support for Daily Tech News Show by donating to their Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash acetech. That's patreon.com slash A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 1st, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Nicole Lee, Senior Editor of Social and Internet for Engadget, and sometimes reporter on the Internet of Things. Hey, eh, Nicole? Yep, that's me. Thank you for joining us today. It's good to have you. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the big announcements. We had a couple of big announcements in the past two days. Google, well, Nest, actually, talking about Thread. Uh, and you were covering ARM's big announcement about Embed. Yep. So we'll get to that in a moment. But let's start off with the headlines. Bloomberg Business Week reports malware targeting the iOS and Android devices of Hong Kong demonstrators has been discovered. Security company Lacoon discovered an Android app purporting to help activists coordinate protests, but was really malware. In tracing its activities, Lacoon discovered malware designed to steal information from jailbroken iOS devices, not just the Android version. The malicious programs can apparently access your contacts, text messages, call logs, pictures, and even your keychain, which will get them into things like email. Microsoft revealed an upcoming addition to Office called Sway, which can automatically make you sway. No, it can automatically assemble and format presentations. Uh, they're called Sways. Not sure about this name. and uh, But they are kind of cool looking. Multimedia animated interactive presentations that live within a web container. Uh, so you can create, publish, and view from any connected device with access to OneDrive. You do store all of these things in OneDrive. Sway can pull from any website, too. That means uh, you can just drag and drop stuff from Facebook and Twitter. And since it's web-based, it works across platforms. If you make a Sway, you can still show it on iOS, Android, or pretty much anything else that connects to the web. I think you'll find yourself trying out any sways, Nicole. Uh, will it will it need me to actually sway? Because not probably. Do you think we will see a lot of Patrick Swayze based sways? <laughs> I hope so. I do hope so. Nobody puts Microsoft in the corner. Uh, Bloomberg reports Johan Kasberg, Hamburg's privacy watchdog, ordered Google to limit how it combines user data. In 2012, Google changed its privacy policy to unify it and data collection across all properties. The unification of that data collection is what worries Kaspar because it could be misused to compile detailed movement patterns, detect the social and financial status, friendship, sexual orientation, relationship status of users. Casper said users must have the ability to determine how their data is used. TechCrunch reports Facebook's VP of product, Chris Cox, posted on Facebook today apologizing on behalf of the company for any hardship caused by Facebook's real names policy. Controversy began when a single user flagged hundreds of Facebook pages of drag queens for using fake names, using their drag queen names. The pattern wasn't noticed because it was lost among thousands of reports for fake names that Facebook deals with every day. Cox said Facebook will improve its tools for dealing with reports as well as provide more deliberate customer service to flagged accounts so they can better tell the bullies from the people who have a legitimate reason for using the name they use. You know, it's the thing is though they still want you to use at least a like a, a name that you'd commonly go by. Like even even if it's not your legal name, they still want you to you go by your the mm. name that people know you by, you know. So it's you still can't call yourself like I don't know, Captain Crunch or something. I have no idea. Well, I but, think um, if I read uh, Chris Cox's post right, if you go by Captain Crunch, if you know, if you're John Draper <laughs> and you're out there going by Captain Crunch, you could call yourself Captain Crunch yeah, on Facebook. That would be okay. But right. if you're not like, if you're 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 not known as Fruity Pebbles, you can't just decide <laughs> on Facebook to start calling yourself Fruity Pebbles. I guess. Is yeah, that, I mean, it's 
it's cool and also, but you know, they st they still have this policy though. Yeah, you have to. So. Your name has to be relevant outside yeah, Facebook, exactly. is what so, you're saying. So, yeah, you can't so. just pick a username, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, TechCrunch reports that the Windows 10 technical preview is now available as a free download for those who want to test drive the new OS or help hunt bugs in early builds. I just installed it on a virtual machine right before the show. Uh, I started installing it around 105 and I was done by 120 on a virtual machine with not a whole lot of RAM, not a whole lot of resources. Pretty impressive there. Uh, you can either update a Windows installation. If you're already on a Windows box, you can choose just to update that installation. Or you can get an ISO, which is what I did, uh, and use that on either on a virtual machine or, or burn it or put it on a USB drive to install on another device. If you join the Windows Insider program, you'll also be able to submit feedback through a dedicated app. Preview expires in mid-April of 2015, or as TechCrunch <laughs> puts it, you have 196 days to enjoy it. Now. Uh, if you want to take the plunge, head to preview.windows.com. Bloomberg reports that people familiar with the plans, I don't know if I've heard that combo before, uh, say <laughs> Apple will add a gold color option to the latest version of the gold. iPad. Gold! Rumors say that that might be unveiled at a rumored announcement rumored to take place October 21st. <laughs> Apple oddly declined to comment, but other Apple products have been gold, so that, to me, makes this rumor golden. But, um, yeah, it doesn't make, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, right? Golden iPad. It would be the least surprising thing. <laughs> it's the least surprising thing. To happen from Apple. I don't, uh, people are really excited about this, though, for some reason. I guess they just like the they gold. They just like the gold. The yeah. gold iPhone. Who doesn't love gold? Who gold. doesn't love it? <laughs> GigaOM reports Verizon decided at the last minute today not to throttle unlimited plan subscribers on its LTE network. The plan had been that starting today, when the network is congested, they would knock the heaviest unlimited plan users down to 3G speeds. Verizon's statement says that after a few months of dialogue, which I believe <laughs> means ranting at us, uh, the company, quote, decided not to move forward with the planned implementation of network optimization for 4G LTE customers on unlimited plans. They just can't say anything straight, can they? Yeah, it's Verizon, man. Like, I just don't... They just need to get their story straight. Yeah, well, I, if you read between the jargon, they are at least not implementing the throttling plan, which is good for the unlimited folks. Very good. Time now for some news from you. Uh, these are things that are submitted on our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, you ought to. There's some great stuff in there. People finding things that are like, it, it, instead of complaining like, Tom, why don't you cover X? You can go to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and you can vote on X. You can find those links or even submit it yourself. Captain Kipper submitted uh, this first one. Rule Britannia! Britannia rule the wave files and MP3s and VOBs. What I'm trying to say is UK copyright law has been amended and starting today, subjects of Her Majesty are free to copy MP3s, CDs, DVDs, and live broadcasts for personal use, as well as enjoy broader fair use, parody, and quotation rights. This means you are no longer a bandit filthy outlaw for copying music to your phone or cloud storage folder, and you can also quote and parody the work of others without their permission, as long as it's fair dealing. It's got to be fair dealing. Yeah. Hey, don't mind the gap, still in the UK universe, the screen gap, that is, the runaway snail folks, or folk, I think it's just one person, runaway snail submitted a 9 to 5 Google report that early purchasers of the Samsung Galaxy Note 4 have complained of a small gap between the screen and the device case. Gapgate! Gapgate, oh no! Today, Android Central discovered that the Note 4 owner's manual actually references the screen gap, calling it a necessary manufacturing feature and states that some rocking or vibration of parts may occur. The manual goes on to explain that friction between parts may cause this gap to expand slightly. So it's a feature. Gapgate over. The Galaxy Note 4 uh, went on sale September 26th in Korea. It's coming to the U.S. in October. Uh, so did, That's silly. Why don't we have a gap? Why don't we have a bunch of people really upset about oh gap? Oh, my God, gap game. Um, yeah. It probably happened. It probably existed in previous phones, I'm guessing. Yeah. I don't think this is a big deal. 
And Metal Freak uh, sent us a PC World article about the Google Play Store, which is attempting to add a little more transparency by making developers list a price range for in-app purchases in their app descriptions. The article includes a screen grab of EA's FIFA 15 Ultimate Team with a price range for in-app purchases of $0.99 cents to $99.99. Google Play Store does not require developers to list exactly which items cost how much. So your next question, what the heck could be worth 100 bucks in FIFA 15 Ultimate Team Mobile Edition? That question for now remains unanswered. At least by me. I'm not going to go spend $100 to find out. Actually, I guess you could just play FIFA 15 and try to figure it out. Somebody send us That's somebody true. out there's playing FIFA 15 on Android. But what's tell us what it costs 100 bucks in there. Can you do you have any idea what what that would be? I don't know. Maybe a special like you can play as your favorite player, but I don't. I don't see how that would be yeah. worth hundred bucks. I don't know. Messy. That's Messy. it. That's yeah, the that's only the one only that's that I could imagine Messy. them getting a hundred bucks for. And that is a look at the headlines. All right, uh, the quest to unify the Internet of Things carries on. As we mentioned, uh, ARM introduced their Internet of Things platform. It's actually an older platform called Embed, M-B-E-D, right? This has Mm -hmm. been around for a while, Nicole. Since 2006, so it's been around for eight years. But uh, what they've basically announced is like like an attempt to put it all together, right? Like they have this ecosystem. So the idea is they roll out this new OS, this uh, Embed operating system, and you can, and they, it works along with the device server. So it's a, it's a unified platform that a manufacturer, an OEM, or whatever, can use this platform end-to-end operating system to the server-side solution. And they don't have to deal with like implementing you know, HTTP or Bluetooth stacks or whatever. They just, just have this OS ready to go, and they can put their IoT thing together. So they focus on their device and they focus on their application. They don't have to focus on the underlying operating system. Exactly. Because that makes things a lot easier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I, so I can do this on my Intel Atom processor or my <laughs> Qualcomm processor yeah, with ARM's this, OS? This is free, and this is free, but it's yeah. only free for ARM processors, specifically the Cortex-M processors, because these are the low-cost, low-power chips uh, commonly used in, you know, like a Nest or a Pebble or whatever, so low, low-power devices like that. That, this is where it gets interesting for yeah. me because this makes perfect sense for ARM. They're they're putting yeah. this out mostly under an Apache license. Some parts of it remain proprietary, but most of it's open source. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's going to make it easier to adopt. It's going to make it uh, easier to develop. On the other hand, uh, I have to use an ARM processor. Yeah. Well, you could argue most people are using <laughs> the ARM processor already, so maybe that's not that big of a of a hump. But you still have to use the ARM processor. Yeah, uh, you know, it's yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, it's it's like I think that was, that was what was so interesting about the announcement. It's like this is really cool that you can use it for any ARM processor, and they were seeing how this would like make things less fragmented, you know, more open, the ability to for devices to speak to each other, but only ARM devices to speak to each other. So it's not really open. Uh, so it, it's like a very it's like a strange it's it's a step forward, but also like I wish there was more than that, you know. Yeah, they're basically like it's open source as long as you only develop it for this, for this processor. And that, you know, for people who don't understand, ARM is a design reference. They yeah. basically license out the design, and then other people make the chips. Yeah. Uh, so, so you can find other chips out there. You know, the the Nvidia chips are made on an ARM license. They are not a fabricator like Intel, but they sort of have the weight of one because so many mobile devices and so many embedded devices use them. And when you look at the Internet of Things, you're not talking about wearable devices. Let's say, you know, get watches out of your head, although no, they I kind mean, of fit in. What, you're, what kinds of things are you talking about here, Nicole? These are things like in, like, again, I mentioned the third, like in thermostats, in kitchen appliances. And, you know, they're saying that the, a possible application would be in street lamps or traffic lights. Like basically very low power. These are designed to last for years, you know, months and years. Uh, without having to change your battery, and the idea is to like, get just get data, just get little bits of data about, for example, a traffic light sensor or whatever would would be able to track uh, gather patterns, traffic patterns or congestion patterns, so that the city would know like how to deal with traffic flow, for example, um, or uh, or or if it's in your like refrigerator or your Nest thermostat, you know, or your lighting, the Philips Hue lighting. And that was just like again, it's for like to communicate with the internet to see like you know are you home or not, that kind of thing. 
Yeah. So the way I understand it, and and some other folks out there may be more well versed in this than me, but that you've got the devices, right? You've got mm -hmm. your Nest thermostat, your light bulbs, the stuff you're you're just talking about. Mm -hmm. You have your protocols for connecting those devices. That's your Zigbee's uh, and uh, Thread is a new protocol that was founded by Samsung, Nest, Silicon Labs, and Big Ass Fans. That's just the name of the company. Uh, <laughs> and and Thread is is another one of these protocols to communicate. Yes. There's lots of those kinds of protocols out there. Zigbee is is, is probably the most it's familiar. It's pretty well known, right? yeah. It's pretty well. well so you got your devices, you got your protocols, uh, and then you have now, you have Embed, which is like, we're going to be the operating system. It's a very yeah. small operating system. We're going to save you a lot of battery life. Uh, and you can use whatever protocol you want. You can use whatever device you want as yeah. long as it's an ARM processor. There's already two consortiums out there trying to come up with open standards. There's yeah. the Open Interconnect Consortium, which involves Intel, Samsung, Broadcom, Atmel, and Dell. Yeah. And then there's the All Scene Alliance, which involves Qualcomm and the Linux Foundation. Mm -hmm. So where does Embed fit? Do you know where Embed fits with those two things? Because it's not trying to be the architecture, these platforms are trying to unify the protocols and all of that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, notice who I said, Open Interconnect has Intel, Allseen has Qualcomm, and this is ARM over here doing an operating system. How do these three relate? Right, so those that you mentioned earlier, like those open consortiums, the consortiums are working on like general standards for IoT so that they, call, they all speak the same language, right? Um, like all join and this, I think I think Qual the all one uses Qualcomm's all join uh, software platform. Anyway, but That's the right. yeah. so ARM this is not a standards group. Okay, this is a free customizable OS. Think of it like Linux or you know Android for Google for the, the phones. So this this is this is a, an OS that anyone can use, but this is not a like a, a standards group or a standard that anyone can take on. So this is basically an op an open sourced uh, Internet of Things platform that anybody with an ARM processor device um, can take on and use. It's free, you know, it's it's like licensable, um, but it's not a standards group. So don't think of this as like, you know, it's 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 a very different thing. Like, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's what causes me concern yeah. is Intel's not going to want to standardize towards embed. They're, right. you know, obviously not. And certainly Qualcomm is not going to want to standardize towards embed. So suddenly, even though it's not a standards organization, embed looks like it will not easily be accepted into the Open Internet Connect Consortium and the All Scene Alliance. Maybe that's not a big deal because Embed says, hey, we'll work with all protocols. We'll work with Zigbee. Right. We'll work with Thread. All you know, them, yeah. we'll work with all of this stuff. So maybe it doesn't matter because like you're saying, Linux doesn't have to necessarily be a member of the USB Alliance for Linux to be able to work with USB. <laughs> right. But as early users of Linux know, implementing USB drivers was a pain, you know, right. And 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 so things will be a lot easier if everybody cooperates. I feel like uh, we're headed towards confusion, and maybe it'll be a confusion of Mac versus PC, where it's like, oh, are you on the uh, OIC or the All Join uh, platform for your home? <laughs> right? If it comes down to just two, maybe that's okay. But right. I want it. I want it to be easy. I want it to be Wi-Fi, where it's like, hey, yeah. if I buy a device, I know it's going to be able to use this protocol. Yeah, I think the I think the uh, Open Internet Consortium, the OIC, they were thinking of maybe someday like every single um, thing that can work together will have like OIC badge next to it. Yeah. You know, like this Nest has an OIC badge, so this will work with my whatever my uh, light system that has an OIC badge. But it's it's just really difficult to get everyone on the same page, and you know, it's as you say, it's it's a little bit weird that it doesn't work together right off the bat, but I think it's a I think it's a good step. You know, it's open source, it's ARM, which is a huge cloud, and all these devices already have ARM chips in it. So I think I think it's good to have at least a bigger chunk of it out there. It just, yeah. just makes it easier for internet of things to just get started in the first place. The more we talk about it, the better I feel. Yeah. Because I and I think what you said about like think of this like Linux is the way to think about it. Uh, embed is Running going to run on ARM designed processors, right? Yeah. That's no different than Microsoft making Windows that only runs on x86. And granted, I know there's Windows RT out there that muddies <laughs> the waters, but for for decades, right? Windows only ran on x86 processors. Yeah. Uh, so if if you think about it like that, and add to that, what I just realized is we as consumers 
are used to dealing with the operating system on laptops and desktops, but on Internet of Things, on embedded devices, we're not going to care about the operating You're system. Not really at all. We're not going to care, care about the application. Or ARM or right? <laughs> yeah, we just want to know that it works and connects. So that exactly. protocol, that connecting protocol is the only thing that matters. At least to consumers. And so then it comes down to, okay, well, whether it has Embed or not, as long as Embed is working with Zigbee IP, Zigbee NAND, six low WP, Yeah, and I think, you know, know, the fact that it works with Thread, I think it's a big deal because Thread is supported by Nest and Google and Samsung and all of those. So Yeah, and, uh, and, and I noticed that um, Silicon Labs is in the Embed uh, group yeah. mm -hmm. and they're also in the thread group yeah. uh, and I think I, I can't remember if they're in OIC or 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 uh, or all seen I think they might be in OIC I'd have to double check on that but um, Nest Labs project manager Chris Boros in the thread announcement yesterday said we feel there should be a second network in the home which is why they're doing thread they don't think Wi-Fi is good enough for this stuff uh, I I can see why he might think that and I as long as it works and as long as I don't have to think about it when I buy my thing <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm okay with that. Um, so yeah, OS uh, embed coming this quarter for developers. Devices they expect sometime next year. And if you're interested in Thread, uh, those tech docs are expected May 2015. And they're looking at possibly having a certification program by June 2015. So get, get out there, developers. Make us some Internet of Things and make it standard. Yes. Yeah. I already have enough to think about. Without <laughs> like, is this door lock going to connect with my light bulbs? <laughs> I hope it does. Don't even get me started on HomeKit and where oh, that yeah, falls HomeKit, in here. Yeah, all of this, yeah, it's another thing. All right, let's take a look <laughs> at the calendar. We, what were you going to say? No, I was wondering HomeKit. I just forgot about that. Yeah, that's a whole, not, that's a whole, other, that's a whole yeah. other issue. That's Yeah, that's just messing with you. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow, October 2nd, is the GeekWire Summit in Seattle, uh, DC Tech Day in the capital of the United States, Washington, DC. Uh, the Tech Week Conference takes place in New York, October 2nd through the 3rd, and the Evernote Conference takes place in San Francisco, October 2nd through the 3rd as well. Uh, and because uh, we're headed into uh, a new quarter, we are going to have some IPOs and earnings, and tomorrow is the IPO for online furniture seller Wayfair, Inc., so if you've been deep into the online furniture selling, uh, look for that stock. Our pick of the day is G.I. Joe Coffee Company, courtesy of Scott Napier. Uh, Scott writes, G.I. Joe Coffee Company is awesome. They sell fair trade, good quality coffee, but 20% of all proceeds go to support disabled veterans. I know you get tons of picks, but I figured I had to throw this one in the mix since it's a cause near and dear to my heart, retired army, and 90% disabled myself. Well, thank you for your service, Scott. Uh, the, and, and, and of course, thank you for the uh, pick as well. Check it out, gijoecoffee.com. I love the combination of fair trade coffee, helping farmers, and then proceeds going to support disabled veterans, uh, people that helped uh, defend the country. That's that's an amazing combination. Absolutely love it. Uh, thank you, Scott. GIJoeCoffee.com. You can send your picks to feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. And you can find my picks at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash picks. All right. Uh, Windows 10. We got lots of thoughts from the community, uh, Nicole, and I, uh, I know that you, like everybody else, have been following uh, the news. Do you have any initial impressions before we get into the feedback? Uh, just at first glance, like the, the start menu looks with the live tiles. I don't know how, I, how often I would use that, the live tiles in the start menu. It doesn't, it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem that appealing to me, again, mm -hmm. from... Someone who hasn't even using Windows for too long, but it looks nice. It looks pretty. Uh, it looks like it's much easier, much easier to get around. So I mean, I vibe. I'm optimistic. You saw my reaction when I yeah. opened the Start menu for the first time. It was like seeing an old friend. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, you're back! <laughs> Look at you with your File Explorer and your Documents <laughs> link. It's amazing." Uh, and you know, I don't know whether the live tiles will end up being that useful. They're they're just like application shortcuts. Although the fact that they're live, like I can see that Guy Brennan invited me to an event. You know, through the oh, little, right. That's right. Yeah, little the friends tiles. widget, and my calendar has a couple things on it, and there's news in the little news widget here. So. You know, and we'll see. Oh, look, Charlie Myerson posted in the WPGUFM oh, group. Uh, so you know, <laughs> yeah. The, the numbering is the, the numbering is a little silly. The Windows 10, but I guess they wanted to, you know, keep on pace with OS X. I guess you know, but that's 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 just numbering systems. Yeah, and uh, QNX Monkey points out you can pin uh, tiles as desktop apps too, which is kind of nifty. So you get you finally get the live desktop done right. 
Uh, so here's some more thoughts on Windows 10 brought to you by the DTNS community. Tom Barrett writes, call me cynical, but I think part of the reason for the numbering was to give it parity with the other major desktop OS, OS 10. I've heard a lot of people say that. I imagine maybe that was a small part of the decision. I don't think it would be the determination. That was this joke I saw on Twitter. I can't remember who said it, but they were saying, I bet they were deciding between Windows 10 and Windows 1. Yeah, I think, well, they, it sounded in the presentation like they wanted it to be called Windows, Windows one. 1 because of OneDrive and all of that yeah. uh, stuff. Maybe they should have. Just call it O-N-E, not Windows 1.0. Because that, that has yeah. already been done. But uh, Cy Spence writes, in regards to Microsoft naming their new OS child Windows 10, yes, at first I want to hand them a chart and make them recite 1 to 100 by memory. Perhaps, perhaps they avoided 9 for a reason. They've had a few Windows 9s before, 95 and 98. They could have wanted to avoid any possible confusion between those ancestor versions and the most recent infant. That made me think it was the librarian who is involved in the naming. Like, no, well, then I'll have to alphabetize <laughs> Windows 9 before Windows 95, and that's just wrong. Um, I don't know about that one. Yeah. Steve in the OC writes, if I'm supposed to skip every other version of Windows and Windows 9 was perfect, should I skip 10? You're not supposed to skip every <laughs> other version. Uh, and this still is the next version, and I think it's a good one. Metal Freak has a slightly stronger opinion. Bleep you! To whomever thought they should skip a number so that I have to waste a lot of time, most of it won't be paid for, explaining to people that, no, you didn't miss <laughs> Windows 9. It was never released. When people ask me why Microsoft skipped Windows 9, I think I'm going to say something like this. It's because Microsoft alternates be between releasing versions of Windows that work okay and versions that are crap, and the last version, Windows 8, was crap. So instead of making Windows 9, which should have been a version of Windows that worked okay and wasn't very frustrating to use, they skipped to Windows 10 <laughs> because they know it's going to be a total pile of crap, which means you should skip Windows 10 and maybe buy a Chromebook while Microsoft works out the bugs <laughs> for the next release. Working in tech support is hard enough. They really don't need to go out of their way to make it harder. Oh, man, that's, that's hilarious. I mean, that's going be the inevitable question. Well, so what happened to Windows 9? Did I, did I miss it? And you know he's right. There's going to be so many people <laughs> gonna be that so he's going to have to deal with, and it's, it's just going to get tiresome. I, I totally feel for you, man. Uh, finally, Mike in lovely Beirut writes, I love your talk on Windows 10 in today's episode and agree that the hybrid model mixing Windows 7 and 8 out of the gate to help transition to Windows as a tablet interface. That said, I've defended Windows 8 as aspirational with the Surface as a benchmark for manufacturers. Unfortunately, I don't think any of them measured up. Most of the innovative form factors have specs of a lower end laptop and premium prices. I've been unhappy with my Asus laptop since I got it, but couldn't find a Windows 8 hybrid that had enough memory to store my music collection, which is a deal breaker, until the Surface 3 came out. I'm hoping, like so many things Microsoft has done, the hardware eventually catches up with good software concepts. And I know I've only been using this thing for an hour yet, but just the ability to take those few tiled apps that I did need to access, like the store, and mm -hmm. put them in a window, I, it's tremendous. It's, it's, it's a huge release. I didn't realize how much that bugged me until I was able to do it. I, I, I think, personally that this is the right way to go about it. The start menu feels right. The start uh, menu, yeah. The windowed apps feel right. The, the feel of this, you know, just... And the reason I didn't mind Windows 8 so much is that most of the time when I was using it, it felt like 7 uh, and, and the good things about Windows 7. So, you know... It's going to take a while. Obviously, there are bugs in here, especially with the uh, multiple desktops. Q and X Monkey and I were talking about how you can't you get the same settings in every virtual desktop. Hopefully, yeah. they'll they'll work that out. This is a technical preview, uh, but I'm interested to try it more. I am I'm optimistic, Nicole. I really am. That's good. It's good to be optimistic about Windows. I feel. Yeah, I I I think it's the right direction. And and as Molly and I talked about yesterday, it just has to be. It just has to work. Like, it feels like the outline they've described is the right outline, as long as they can execute on it. Well, that is it for this episode of Daily Tech News Show. Uh, Nicole Lee is the author of the Engadget story on that ARM embed. If you're like, I want to know more about that, she's got a great write-up over there. Check it out, Engadget.com. Uh, you can follow Nicole on the Twitters at twitter.com slash Nicole. Yes. She is the first person I ever followed on Twitter. I felt a little bad when I signed up for Ello, but I didn't follow you first. <laughs> That's okay. That's uh, okay. Well, but, Tim Stevens followed me first. So. Oh, that's a good one. Nice so, little yeah. transition there. <laughs> uh, so follow, follow Nicole on Twitter. Anything else going on you want to let folks know about? 
Uh, I'll be at the Evernote conference this uh, next couple of days. I think there'll be a couple of announcements of new Evernote stuff. So um, stay tuned for that. And uh, that's all I have so far. So. Very cool. Are you using Ello so far? I'm just curious. I am just, I'm using, I check it almost, I just check it every day just to see if there's any updates or whatever. And the thing is, I like that, I like the interface a lot. And I wish I had far more reason to use it. Mm -hmm. But I have no reasons to use it. Yeah, I think that's going to be its downfall if it has one, is not finding a reason. Maybe it'll find one. Maybe the, Maybe. the reason will bubble up here uh, shortly. We'll see. Yeah. Well, thank you also to all of our bosses. It's payday, October 1st. Uh, this is the day when Patreon goes and, and uh, collects the folks who've pledged money to us. And we sincerely appreciate every single one of you who has helped make the show possible, uh, not just on Patreon, but through PayPal and, and Bitcoins and Dogecoins and, and donated logos and, and just telling folks about the show. Uh, you guys are the reason we do the show and we deeply appreciate that you see enough value in it to give a little value back. 4,315 of you, you're rock. Uh, dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate. If you were like, what are you talking about? I would like to maybe support the show somehow. Check that out for more information. Uh, we have things like t-shirts and stuff. You can find those links at dailytechnewsshow.com as well. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. That's one way of supporting the show. Email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. And listen to the show live, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 Pacific at alphageekradio.com. Our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. I'll be back tomorrow with Anthony Carboni back on the show. Talk to you then. Nicole. Thank you. I'm sorry about the cat. Oh, I didn't even notice the cat. <laughs> the cat was trying to get, was trying oh, to no. photobomb me and rub against my microphone. Jenny, and, um... we're cat friendly on this show, right? 100%. <laughs> okay. I can't hear you, Jenny. You're unmuted. The answer is oh. yes. The answer is I yes. To, I have to mute my microphone sometimes because, um, uh, what do you call it? Audio Hijack Pro still picks it up even when I mute the thing. Mm. Mm. So I forget to unmute it, and I'm back up recording for you. So right. Um, and yes, we are a super cat-friendly show. This household has three cats. <laughs> I will admit that on the internet. Okay. <laughs> it's like this machine kills fascists that Woody Guthrie had on his guitar, <laughs> except the, our version is this show hugs cats. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. No, because my cat was purring next to the microphone. I was like, okay, you know, you know what? You're, you're <laughs> off the show. Off the show. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much uh, yes, for having me you, on. Nicole. And um, I hope you feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you I couldn't hope, tell. I hope, you did a great job. Oh, thank you. I hope your Cardinals win uh, this weekend. Thank you. There'll be some <laughs> internal strife. I'm in, sure there will the be. Household, but, but I'm rooting on your side. It'll be fine. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I, I figure all the Giants fans will be until Obviously. the Giants play the Cardinals. Obviously. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. So, uh, Jenny, are you a Dodgers fan? Wait, are you kidding? Well, I know you're a Red Sox fan, but like, do you have a National League affinity? Oh, all right. So, not the Dodgers. Okay. Uh, because John Lester went to Oakland, mm -hmm. we were super interested in last night's game. Although, we have to say... Heartbreaker. Say, heartbreaker. Heartbreaker. But, uh, somehow the Royals managed to win that game despite their manager <laughs> according to Pedro Martinez who is right about everything uh, and it was really one of the best baseball games I think I've ever seen until I mean like I've ever yeah seen. it was a great game no you're right it was amazing it was just like a team that would not quit and so we're I think we're like oddly more interested in the baseball playoffs this year even though the Sox aren't in it Interesting. Um, these are such good teams. Like you've got young teams, like the Nationals. You've got like teams that maybe shouldn't, like 
squeak through like i mean the pirates like it's just kind of awesome um yeah it's nice i mean there's some familiar faces in there for sure and i know that people who aren't cardinals fans are probably tired of seeing the cardinals in there every year but it is nice not to see oh it's yankees red sox right again i worry about that i don't want the yankees to play the red sox in the playoffs all the time because god what could you possibly say about it at this point (laughs) right a storied rivalry it's like every time I hear that when they play each other in regular season, I, I'm just like, guys, it's over. We gotta find I'm, new things to talk about. I'm gonna go to Showbot in Windows 10. Ooh. To pick our title. It works. It's Microsoft Sway or the Highway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, embedded arm go. dealers. CS803 is a master of the pun. Mm-hmm. I like that one. Call me Fruity Pebbles. <laughs> you got any favorites in here? Um, I do really like it's Microsoft Sway or the Highway, but I also <laughs> like Embedded Arm Dealers because that was actually yeah, and that's the main about. the main topic. Gives it a little edge. Start <laughs> menu withdrawal. That's funny, Todd. <laughs> Sway your arms, Janice Goo 7. You know how I feel about the mashup titles. Mm-hmm. Microsoft lost its sways. But it didn't. It got them. It got them back, Beatmaster. Or it invented them or put them out. Wow, you guys were really into using sway in the title. It's their sway. Yeah. It's the sway they, they do it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's why, right? Mm-hmm. It lends it is itself. It's a definitely punnable word. Oh, Cubs D backs game. Yeah. Is that a Chicago person or an Arizona person, though? What? I'm looking in the chat room. Let's see. Oh, wait. It's in response to see what we got. Oh, it must be someone in Arizona who likes the Cubs. Right? Which I don't, you know, unless you're born that way and. I believe that unless that's, you're born that way with the Cubs loving defect. With the Cubs, well, <laughs> I know saying. at this point it could be considered an actual illness. I don't know if I'd call social services for parents turning their children into <laughs> Cubs fans, but yeah, I might al- gently alert somebody. I mean, yeah, it, that is a painful. I would, I would definitely want the children to know that they are free to make a choice. Yeah, <laughs> and the White Sox are so close. Yeah, yeah. I kid, Cubs fans. Some of my best friends are Cubs fans. It's actually true. Literally true. In Arizona, but a Cubs fan. Well, J.B. Hanna, the hearts of all kind people go out to you. J.B. Hanna, we like you anyway. Yeah, poor guy. And, not, and I'm guy not talking about the Arizona part. Arizona's poor awesome. Cubs fan. Sorry. It's a hard row. Yeah. For your hose. Although, I guess the... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't come out right. No. The gardening tool. Come on. I uh, I think that uh, I think the Cubs have spring training in Arizona. Do they not? They did. So many people have moved around, but I think you I think they do. Yeah, yeah. Because I've seen an A's Cubs yeah. game in spring training when I've gone down there. Yeah, the trend has actually been to move to Arizona off of the East Coast, um, which may or may not have anything to do with athletes' performance <sighs> being there. Uh, but it's actually just a uh, you know. Did you see what JB Hanna said? <laughs> Granddad's fault. Originally from that area, was a Cubs fan and was 15 when they were last in the World Series. Oh my gosh! Ouch! That is, you know, if the Cubs ever get to the World Series, even if they're playing uh, the Red Sox, I will root for the Cubs. Like, oh, I, I will. Just I will. Take, I will never root for the Cubs for anything. I will take anything. a pause and just root for the Cubs. I'll tell you what I'll do. If the Cubs get to the World Series against anyone but the A's, I will remain silent. <laughs> well, if the A's get to the World Series, I I would have a tough time. With the, I won't have to worry about them playing the Red Sox, but I would most definitely root for the A's full-throated and vociferously because um, I would really like to see the guy that changed all of baseball win a World Series. Yeah. Like, I t- how many we, places I mean, could Billy Dean have gone by now? If in he, August, if, we thought it was going to happen, and then he made all those trades. And I'm yeah. not saying the trades are the reason. They Maybe they're not. But the best team in baseball through most of the season just fell apart. 
Yeah. It's it's tough thing when you change like a really chemistry centric team. And that's around totally the one player against that everybody loved. What you just said, which is that he changed baseball because he ignored things like that. Yeah. But I think there's something to it. I really there, do. Is a, I think after watching 10 years of baseball with the Red Sox, which is not a lifetime, but it was a very intense 10 years, like I think I certainly would agree that it is a it is a percentage mix. Of and didn't like you have Dee Podesta, Paul Dee Podesta, for a while as your GM? No. Or was, no, it's no, but Theo, but Theo was, was Theo. a disciple of yes. that whole thing. Yes. That's, that's, Dee Podesta the, came from Boston. Yeah. I think he was an assistant. And yes. he came out to. So he was oh. a disciple. It was it, the money, like the first person, the first team, one of the first teams to win it all with the money ball ish, the money ball plus money approach. I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> money ball with the emphasis on the money. <laughs> on the money, because like, <laughs> you, you know, you went out and you acquired like all these incredibly expensive people. And then you're like, we play money ball. And you're like, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I think, um, you know, it's Theo, it's this guy, Ben Sherrington, like the whole Red Sox back office or front office, front office, um, uh, has populated across baseball by now. Like they've mm -hmm. all gone, now they're all GMs, I don't know, you know, like, or assistant GMs, like they are quite the, quite the universe there. Yep. Jonah Hill. Yeah. Jonah Hill, Brad Pitt. <laughs> Yeah, all those guys. I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for these small market teams that should win, and they're missing like one really expensive player. It just Man, it bumps me out. And we were season ticket holders for the A's for years when we lived in Oakland, uh, and yeah. they got so close so many times. So many good memories though like the ramon hernandez walk-off bunt and winning game 20 and the 20 game win streak and just yeah. seeing oh, hudson Mulder. That? yeah we were there for game 20. wow that was amazing that's impressive yeah um just just insane just good feelings and and yet yeah. never getting into the world series just so Frustrating. Yeah, that's, that's frustrating. Which obviously we have a Cubs fan in the chat room. And I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I want it, one. <laughs> I'm not trying to compare the two scenarios, believe me. Um, yeah. But yeah, so fun. And the thing I liked about being a season ticket holder for the A's too, and this is actually true of most season ticket holder communities, but you just had that really good feeling of getting to know the people sitting around you and all pulling for the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting when Matt and I would buy crappy tickets to go see the Red Sox play the Angels here, we would have a terrible time with the fans. And the moment we got down to like serious season, like we got tickets right behind the dugout this year, the Red Sox uh -huh. dugout, the fans were amazing. They were uh -huh. like the thoughtful, wonderful baseball fans that you hope you sit next to from the opposing right. team. And we had a lovely time. But it's like, you're right. When you're a season ticket holder, I feel like you take a longer view of baseball. Yeah, you, you start to you start to to have a little more empathy for the other other teams because yeah yeah because you know them so well like yep. if you're really going to all those games you know all those people and like oh man I, I don't know it's time to start reading baseball books again in absence of the real thing um, in a month it, what do you think of this plan to like split the games up on all the different networks did you see this? Um, w I'm not sure what you, do you mean the blackout thing or? No, I mean that this year the American league games are only being oh, covered see. by one network and the yeah. national league games only by another. It's so weird. Well, but they, they started that when they split the, the AL and NLCS up. Yeah. I just, they, they gave TBS one and they gave right. Fox the other. That's, right. that's when this started. And this is all moving towards four. MLB having more leverage not letting any one network have all the leverage yeah. and because MLB eventually just wants to be the one who they, charges they you want the money. it on their MLB network yep. channel, which is like, yeah, delivered direct to you. It. They want, here's what they want. They want to deliver it direct to you over the internet. They absolutely do. Once everybody's getting all their TV over the internet, they want to deliver it direct to you over the internet and have you pay and sell you ads. Yep. Yep. It's exactly what they want. And, and I'll tell you something. They are the organization of all of the major sports teams that I think is smart enough to do it first. Oh, let giving the contract 
to a company and basically telling that company you have no other clients. You are, you are an independent company, so you're not infected by our own prejudices, but you're not distracted by anyone else. You're just working for us. That was the most brilliant thing that any mm -hmm. sports league has done because Major League Baseball Advanced Media does an amazing job on lots yep. of fronts, not just on the yep. streaming video, but also on MLB.com and the way they have independent beat reporters, you know, covering mm -hmm. the teams. It's, it's, it's really, really clever. Yeah. I don't like much of what Bud Selig has done. But that was uh, yeah. a good call. That was smart. I went to an awful lot of Bud Selig press conferences for someone who didn't actually cover the sport. Skeletor. Uh, and he, I know, he's a, he's a sunken looking dude, but he is a smart man. Yeah. Oh no, I won't argue with you there. Um, yeah, That's actually one of the Freak problems. Right. Metal Freak is actually right. Is that WWE was also a trailblazer in this regard. Um in terms of, uh, you know, really embracing the internet. But I don't know about that as well, because I don't watch dudes wrestle. <laughs> if you count that. You mean if they start wrestling in front of you, you avert your eyes? I avert my eyes. <laughs> I just avert my eyes. You are wrestling. No. <laughs> All right, I think I finally got everything posted. It's a little, it's like just slightly more complicated now because I'm putting files in two places, but I'll get into the rhythm of that eventually and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Let me actually get out of the post. All right. Thanks everybody for watching Daily Baseball and Tech News Show. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.